one of your videos, you say that uh, the problem with the world is that uh, most people lack the intensity. Uh -huh. Most people lack the necessary intensity. Mm -hmm. And then you say the way is dhyana. So intensity is more associated to fierceness in personality and dhyana is more associated to calmness. So they are somehow counterintuitive. Can you elaborate a little? People think uh, peace means rest in peace. <laughs> because their idea of peace is death. Peace can be very intense. Peace can be tremendously intense because peace means the reverberations of life have become subtle and intense. Action means reverberations of life are not so subtle, it is at a certain level. So peace happens not because… peace may happen if somebody is dead, but to be alive and peaceful means you need to be highly intense state of energy, otherwise you can't be peaceful. The reason why most people who don't have any problems as such, you know, after all they're trying to earn a living, uh, reproduce and bring up their children and die one day, just for that they're freaking simply because of lack of intensity. Because life is happening at a low ebb, naturally everything is a problem. If it rises a little bit, suddenly you have a little clearer view of everything. For this you need a higher intensity of energy within you. And the yogic system is essentially focused towards that. Dhyana does not mean <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, let's take the next question uh, here, right here in the front row, yeah. What I get from Isha's philosophy, if I may say there is, is that you need to see internally, in your interiority. You need to fix it internally before fixing your external situations. But is it also not right? Is it also not very important to do the right thing externally, you know? Uh, just to make myself more clear, you know, if I be more… No, no, I, I'm clear, I get the question. <laughs> Why do I look so dumb? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say, you know, if… I got it. Yeah. I got if somebody it. is born… I got the question. <laughs> Isha's philosophy is not about looking internally or externally. It is just that if you're looking for mangoes, you look up the tree, you don't dig the earth, all right? <laughs> but if you're looking how to plant a mango tree, then you dig the earth. You're looking for mangoes if you dig the earth, will you find it, I'm asking. So if you inner things, you must look inward, outer things you must look outward. There is no such philosophy, look out or look in. Wherever the damn thing is, look there. <laughs> it's like, you know, Shankar and Pillai went for a job interview and uh, they asked him, which is further, Mumbai or Moon? He thought profoundly and then said, Mumbai. They said, how do you see this? He said, I can see the moon, I can't see Mumbai <laughs> Okay, last question, yeah. Namaskaram Sadhguru, I just want to ask… Hold the mic closer Yeah, to I just want to ask you that everybody's perception of good and bad is different. And what do you think if we start manifesting our own good and bad, what will be the state of the society? Maybe you won't have power tonight <laughs> I think I already made this clear. The, the biggest problem with the world is that too many good people, not enough sensible people. Yeah. Sense is life-specific, okay? Goodness need not be life-oriented. Goodness may be going to heaven. And the moment I want you to understand this dangerous concept, people don't address this. The moment you believe, Suppose I believe there is heaven and it's a beautiful place and you can live in the company of gods. Should I send you there today or no? If I really care for you, I'm saying. <laughs> yes? If I really care for you and if I believe there's a great place, should I send you there or not? This is a dangerous thing, you understand? If you stretch it to its logical end, it's a really dangerous thing. The moment I believe there is a fantastic place up there, I really love you and I want you to go there, you know <laughs> Yes? Okay, Le let me just end by asking you something uh, that we haven't spoken about and then I'll hand it over to Chiki. You said you love machines. I didn't say I love them. Okay, you like I machines or they're useful. They work. Have our, have our lives been overtaken by gadgets? 
Uh, not mine. No? Definitely not. I use all the gadgets but they don't overtake me. These are fantastic things in our life. Things… Th see, in every way, compared to how a human being was, let's say, hundred years ago, you're almost superhuman. Hundred years ago, if I could just pick up something from my pocket and talk to somebody in America right now, I would be superhuman. Why superhuman? If I said I'm God, people would have believed me. Hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, if I just had a light bulb, I would have become God on this planet. I want you to know. Look at the things we have today. We are really superhuman. Once this kind of capability has come to us, little more sense has to rise, little more awareness and consciousness to, has to arise. If this doesn't happen, this capability will turn against us. This is what you're saying. Now gadgets are freaking people. Why? It's a simple thing. You, if you want to use it, you can use it or you can keep it aside. Because you're in a compulsive state, if you start using a cell phone, you can't stop it. Even in your sleep, you're texting, see the boy is… he's in… Uh, he's not with me, he's in… The, looking at me in the screen <laughs> Now, this is the same thing. If food is good, if you start eating, you don't know when to stop. If you start drinking, you don't know when to stop. If you start doing something, you don't know when to stop. The same thing, it is not about the gadget, it is not about the food, it is just that there is not enough consciousness, there is compulsiveness. Everything is happening compulsively. Instead of addressing the root, you're trying to kill the gadget. Gadget is a fantastic thing. Every damn gadget has enhanced our life in a huge way, isn't it? Don't curse the gadgets. It is just that compulsiveness has to go.